So it's time to discuss for this topic. Uh, at first, I would like to introduce a four experts of TAVR as a panelist. Kang do Seoul, uh, Seoul Asam Medical Center, Park tae -kyu, Samsung Medical Center, Park kyung -min, Ulsan University Hospital, Lee kyu uh, Daejeon St. Mary Hospital. Please, is, is there any question or comments yeah, to the uh, presenters? Uh, thank you for your nice lectures. And uh, I have a, a comment and question to Dr. Gulli. Uh, your uh, lecture was so fantastic, and I learned a lot. And about the, the cerebral protection device, I think that the problem is that the low risk, low rate of the clinically significant stroke. In our recent uh, hospital data, the significant stroke after TAVA was less than 1%. So uh, I want to ask, ask your strategy for using the cerebral protection device. Do you routinely use the cerebral protection device for whole TAVA patient? Or do you have any your selective criteria for high risk uh, patient? So at present, I use it in anyone who's anatomically suitable while awaiting further randomized data. Um, I think that less than 1% still means that one in 100 patients have a stroke. And who wants to be the one in 100? And at the moment, I don't think we have enough way of predicting who that one in 100 is going to be. We do know that there are some risk factors, female patients. Well, that's going to mean that we're still putting our device into a significant number of them. Uh, valve in valve procedures, bicuspid valves, uh, some evidence whether we did a calcium score on the valve and having more calcium, if they've had a toe and they've got arch atheroma. But by the time we try to pick out all of those people and say, well, they're the only ones that are going to get it, we're putting, in a, putting the cerebral protection into a lot of people. So I think, yes, we probably, most of us feel that our stroke rates aren't as high as what's reported but I don't want to necessarily be the one who has that risk of stroke myself if I have a TAVI. I don't want my parents to be the one who has that one in a hundred risk and I want to reduce that by two thirds if I can, relative risk reduction. Um, so yeah, at the moment, everyone, um, and uh, hopefully we will eventually either be able to have better predictors of who should get it or we'll get better randomized data that will tell us whether this is going to be cost effective. Oh, I also have a question to uh, Dr. Kuli. Thank you for your valuable uh, lecture. Uh, I have actually I have no uh, experience about the Sentinel uh, device, but uh, I know that uh, there is a, a, a some complex issue uh, about kinking catheters uh, between Sentinel catheter with uh, uh, pigtail. So, do you have any experience about that? Uh, complex uh, complication, and uh, do you have um, any advice for avoiding that issue? Yeah, so um, I've kind of gone through pretty quickly the deployment of the device there, but we do have a pigtail that's often sitting in the arch, and if you haven't road mapped that, you may have left your pigtail in. So as we come down and flex up to intubate the left common carotid we would routinely pull back on that pigtail to ensure that we're not through the pigtail with the wiring. Uh, at that stage, it's pretty straightforward to get out of there. I think one of the issues that people can get into trouble with is anatomy that they probably shouldn't have gone into to begin with. So our CTs do include a review of the anatomy to make sure there's not excessive tortuosity of the vasculature. Uh, but the other thing that can cause issues sometimes is when they're wired the common carotid and then start to rotate the device round and round and wrap that wire and then lose track of which way they've manipulated the device and have to try and get it out. Uh, but if everyone, if you follow a standard deployment, you're not putting it into anatomy that you probably shouldn't have to begin with. And at worst case scenario, you only deploy the brachiocephalic filter, you're still protecting half of your cerebral circulation and you can proceed with the TAVI without having deployed the uh, common carotid filter. So it would be a very rare thing. It's not, I've not ever had to pull a surgeon or not be able to re uh, remove the device percutaneously, uh, either in my own practice or proctoring the device. So 
it's nothing I've had personal experience of uh, getting into that situation. Uh, I have a question to Dr. Pop. Uh, for the, the same day uh, discharge after the tower, uh, I think uh, we have should have more the strict the criteria the, than the conventional the discharge the patient. So what is the most important factor for the, the same day discharge? Well, uh, I think there are several important factors. Um, number one, we have to make sure that there are absolutely no complications, no access site complications. Uh, anybody that has bleeding after the procedure uh, will have to stay overnight. Um, but if you haven't had bleeding uh, for four hours while you're li laying in bed, and then you've ambulated for two hours and you haven't had a problem, it's very unlikely that you're gonna go home and have a problem. Uh, the second type of complication that people are really afraid of is conduction system problems. And if you haven't had a conduction system problem at baseline, if you don't have a conduction system problem after the procedure or intra-procedurally, we have not yet seen with the Edwards platform a single case that developed a delay AV block that did not have some sort of prolongation of the conduction between uh, either uh, AV conduction or intraventricular conduction. Now, if you're talking about self-expanding valves, that's very well described that that can happen late um, with, uh, let's say, Metronic or any of the other self-expanding valves. Uh, that's why in our protocol, uh, we only allowed self-expanding valves if they were being deployed inside a valve in valve situation and without cracking. But uh, with uh, the Edwards valve, uh, we don't have that concern. If you're gonna have a conduction system problem, it's gonna present early on. Thank you. Uh, I have also a question to Dr. Park. So you mentioned uh, uh, access complication is a uh, uh, first to uh, change for same dis uh, day discharge. So, do you have any change of uh, vascular uh, treatment strategy, uh, such as uh, uh, closing device or anticoagulation protocol? Yeah. So we continue to use uh, two per-close devices. Uh, there is some data, some people argue that a single per-close device is actually better. Uh, we're looking at that, but currently we use two, uh, two uh, per-close devices. Uh, two things that are seemingly minor but have made a tremendous difference for us and this is stuff that we again learned from the experience of David uh, Wood's group in Vancouver. Uh, basically uh, patients, all patients get protamine at the end of the case. We use heparin followed by protamine and uh, we check an ACT at the end of the procedure uh, and uh, we try to get the ACT to be uh, less than uh, 180. Um, if they're higher than 180, uh, generally we'll give a bit more protamine. Uh, the other thing that makes a tremendous difference, it probably doesn't decrease major vascular complications, but it certainly decreases nuisance bleeds that a lot of times are what keeps the patients in the hospital and in bed, uh, is 15 minutes of manual compression at the end of the procedure. So uh, basically our protocol is uh, the two per close devices are uh, deployed, uh, tightened at the end of the procedure. Um, and uh, as we do that, we also administer protamine. Uh, 10 minutes after protamine administration, while pressure is being held, uh, the uh, technician uh, checks an ACT and in rare cases administers extra protamine. And uh, then they continue to hold pressure for a total of uh, 15 minutes. Uh, while the patient is on the table having pressure being held, uh, we do a neurologic exam to make sure that we don't have any complications. And uh, at the same time, uh, somebody checks Doppler pulses, uh, which allows us to know whether there's any uh, vascular uh, problems. Uh, just like the uh, uh, team uh, in Seoul, uh, we use radial access for our secondary access and the uh, radial band is radial catheter is only removed 
after uh, 15 minutes when we, we're sure that uh, there's no access site complications and when we checked an ACT. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's time to close the session because of the time limitation. So thanks for, for three speakers and four panelists for the uh, very educational uh, presentation and discussion. And so thanks again to joining this session and enjoy the rest of this symposium. Thank you.